This is an interview for the Veterans History Project. Do you want a mic check on Jack? Yes, please. Okay. And uh, Jack, what's what's your date of birth? 10-2-17. 10-2-17, okay. Oh, my, my son's birthday is October 1st. October 1st. Yeah. And are you gonna In 1988. Exactly. Pretty much what I do is I just go to the camera, I give the preliminaries for the um, archives, and then I just get into a TV interview with, well, I'll be looking at him. Okay. Yeah. John, let me see you one check. Where did you grow up in Southern California? I grew up in right near UCLA, where oh. UCLA as in West Los Angeles was being developed in those years. Uh -huh. And I went to University High School and graduated from there, and then uh -huh. I went to City College for a year before I went north to Cal, mm -hmm. and I met my wife, my wife to be, uh -huh. in City College. Only she got a degree, to, got a scholarship to business training at USC. Oh my gosh! And then I just I had my mind set on forestry, uh -huh. so I was going north to Cal, and yeah. so there were several years there we commuted back and forth long distance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow! Sounds like you both had a lot going for you. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this, I'm Katie Bosler uh, here for the National Archives. This is an interview with Jack Culbreth, who is a veteran of the 10th Mountain Division. He was born on October 2nd, 1917. And the crew here today are Elizabeth Wagner, Skip Gray, and John Kelly. And um, Jack, can you tell us uh, your branch of service? Well, I went into the Mountain, Mountain Training Center was my first introduction into the Federal, uh, into the Army. Okay, so you're in the Army. And what was your rank? Well, I was a private going in and I came out as a captain. Okay, so you went through uh, through officers training and through... And then I went through officers training at Fort Benning, Georgia. Mm -hmm. and that was between the time when we... I first went into the, into the 87th Mountain Infantry at Camp Hale in, 19, in September 1942. And then in the spring of 43, they had the 87th move to Fort Ord, California to join the 9th Amphibious Task Force being sent to the Alaska uh, co conflict on, on, the, uh, Olympi on the peninsula there. The Aleutians, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunate for me, I didn't get involved in the Alaska campaign, but I got orders to be shipped from Fort Ord to Fort Benning, Georgia where I took officer's training there until December of 1942. And you came out of there as a second lieutenant? I came out of there as a second lieutenant mm -hmm. and was sent right back to the 10th Mountain Division being formed at that time at Camp Hale and the 87th had been expanded to the 86th and 85th regiments were, mm -hmm. were added at that time and called it a true 10th Division. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you um by the time you were in Europe, you were promoted to first lieutenant? Yes. I, while we were in, in Europe, mm -hmm. I was planning. Uh -huh. And then finally you were promoted to captain. Yes. And captain was? That, that uh, was the end of the war. Is that, right? that was uh -huh. just before the end of the war. That was when we, we, came, we started back home. Mm -hmm. We thought we were going to the South Pacific at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, Okay. We are being deactivated in, in Europe and sent the, through the United States to the South Pacific. So your service was uh, solely in, in Italy? It was in Italy, yes. Right, in the Apennines. Okay. All, all training was done in Colorado, with the exception of the short, or, short deal at Fort Ord. Okay, okay. So that's enough of the preliminaries for the National Archives. So okay. now we'll get into our interview. Uh, so, Jack, how did you end up in the 10th Mountain Division? Well, I was working in Yosemite National Park at the time as a park naturalist, and in September of 1942, recruiters came to the park, and they were looking for people to uh, be used in a new, new form uh, called a mountain troops being formed in Colorado. 
So they were asking for rock climbers, skiers, or any other mountaineering experienced men that, the, that we had in the park. So six of us volunteered and were le left the park and went directly to Camp Hale. And how, how did they pitch you? How, how did they sell you on, on uh, this idea of, um, well, of saying yes to the, to the mountain I, troops? I think, I think the, the men that I refer to as the six, I think we were all motivated by the fact that there, there was a war going on. Uh, I had had quite a bit of experience seeing the, the exodus of the Japanese out of the Berkeley area where I was going to school prior, prior to going to the, uh, to the Park Service. You were a student at UC Berkeley and you... I was going to the University of California at Berkeley. And you just graduated at this point. You're working as a naturalist in the park. And I, I was working summers as a naturalist. And as soon as I graduated in 42, I went on, into the Park Service as a naturalist in Yosemite National Park. And uh, it was a quick, quick exodus from there when they told us that what we were needed for. And, so, uh, so at that time, you were a rock climber and a skier. Yes, I'd had rock climbing training and uh, rescue work in Yosemite, and I, I had been skiing for several years. Now, I came across a headline from from 1943, um, rec recruiting, uh, looking for uh, people for the 10th Mountain right. Division, what became the 10th Mountain Division. And the headline was, only he-men need apply. Did, did you consider yourself a he-man? <laughs> I, I never gave it much thought. <laughs> they, they told us they wanted, wanted people that knew how to climb or could instruct people in climbing or, or knew how to ski and could help mm -hmm. skiing. So, uh, so, so you fit the bill. So I guess we fit the, fit the bill that they were looking for <laughs> and away we went. <laughs> So now you're off to training in Camp When I Hale. came back from Fort Benning, uh, we went right into directly to Camp Hale and went into training then in, Dece in the latter part of December. And uh, This would have been the latter part of December of 1943. Okay. And then in the following spring, we had orders and away we went to, to Europe. So you sailed to Naples, Italy. Yes. Um, how long were you at sea, and was that difficult for a land-loving mountaineer? I can't tell you how, how long we were on, at sea, but we were on a boat that went unescorted very rapidly across the Pacific. And the only thing that I can remember was uh, the seasick troops at the time, because we were going at pretty high speed, uh, going maximum speeds. And when we crossed uh, the uh, Gulf Stream, uh, the whole ship warmed up mm. due to the temperature, temperature change on the Gulf Stream, which affected a lot of people. How but, did it affect people? Well, it, you know, here we were, were in the winter going across, and all of a sudden you're going from winter conditions into a uh, hot summer deal, and it, it just was overnight. You know, I mean, it, someone said, "Who turned up the heat in the boat?" <laughs> <laughs> so, so you end up in the Mediterranean. You end up in uh, Naples, Italy, at Christmas time. Right, and it was cold there. Of of 1944. Yes. And what were your first? And so it was cold again. What were your first impressions of Italy? Well, we were rushed off of the boat first when we got into Italy. There were a lot of boats that had been sunk in the harbor, and it was quite a job getting into a dock. And when we were docked, we were hurried away from the dock area because the conflict in Italy was going on further north. It was up above, above Milan at that time, and Naples is away south. So, so the army's w awaiting this, the 10th Mountain Division. They needed you. They, they wanted to get us up, up north as fast as they could. So we overnighted in some quarters called the Mussolini ter Terrace there. And uh, the next morning we found how, our, how did it get the name Mussolini Terrace? I guess it was constructed by Mussolini as far <laughs> as I know. It, we didn't get to see much of it. It was just all marble. And, and it was a cold place to have to try to stay that night. But the next day they began getting us on trucks and uh, coastal steamers and sent us north to Leghorn, Italy, 
which is a, a port just to the west of Naples and Pisa. And uh, that was where we, we were just behind the front lines, you might say, at that point. And you bivouacked there. Uh, pardon? You bivouacked there? Yes. And at that place, you ended up earning a soldier's medal. Tell us what led up to that. Well, we had been on the line for, a, uh, for the first two weeks of our encounter there in, in the, what I call the Milan, Milan area, or the Front Range. And uh, we were sent back for a rest, rest area, and when we went in this rest area, uh, we didn't know it at the time, but there was a main railroad went through part of the camp. And uh, when they posted the guards for the camp that night, they were walking this railroad track and they stepped on a mine. And the man, this one that stepped on the mine, of course, was lost in instantly. And we had a bunch of green medics at the time that rushed from the camp down to take care of the men that was on the, on the railroad tracks. And uh, they went up there and stepped on some more mines. And uh, then I was So at that point you have we, five dead? We had five dead and two or three others that were just standing around there wondering what to do. I had been trained in, in uh, mine war warfare and had attended a camp with some of the boys from the Ammunition and Pioneer Platoon and I picked out three of the biggest guys I had in that platoon and we cleared a path into the minefield. We took the men that were still standing around and alive out first. How do you clear a minefield? Uh, you have to probe by hand. We were on our hands and knees probing a deal until we found the mines and, and deactivated the mines. Sounds like pretty scary duty. It is. And uh, so when we got ever got them out, well then we got the medics in on the trails that we'd cleared and took the other people out. And it was quite some time after that till we noticed that they gave those of us that had worked in the minefield the soldier's medal. And the soldier's medal is only issue, is issued for, com, uh, for troop conduct, uh, not in battle. So that we were considered it not in battle being in the rest area behind the lines at that time. So then you made your way towards the Apennines, um, but on your way you ran into some, some starving Italians. Well, these, these Italians that we ran into in the, in the first foothills there of the Apennines uh, were literally starving at the time. Uh, they lived in these rock, uh, concrete, formed houses that they had. These were farmers? Uh, they're all farmers, usually growing their, their cattle and their few chickens or ducks in the lower portion of the house. And uh, they had depended on that for food and the Germans had stripped them long ago uh, in the campaign of all, all of that livestock. So they had no resources uh, locally there for them. Of course, they they couldn't do much farming with all the battle going on. So they were living mostly on chestnuts, uh, making all kinds of concoctions out of uh, ground up chestnuts. And uh, so when we arrived with the old sea rations, they thought that was a banquet. And we shared many of those sea ration meals with them. And. Uh, I, uh, I had other experiences later on with families when we were up in the Riva Ridge area. Right. Now, 30, 30 years later, you went back to that area for a reunion. Yes, we did, 1985. And, and tell me about that experience and, and how you um, were, were thanked by some of, of these Italians, uh, families who you helped th in 45. Well, when we were getting ready to assault the Riva Ridge, we were in a very, very small village, probably five or six homes. 
at the foot of the, of the, of the uh, cliffs there. And uh, we shared whatever we had with, with some of the native people because we were living in their houses while we were waiting for darkness to make our assault up Beaver Ridge. So um, I took my wife over to this area with me on the 80, 1985 tour. And as we were going down the road, we heard a constant little beep, beep, beep from a small Italian car behind our Jeep. And uh, I pulled over several times and they never would come up and pass us. <laughs> and so I finally stopped the, the Jeep, got out, started to walk back to see what the trouble was with this, this car. The man came running up and he said uh, he only wanted for his son to meet us. Because he said, I was their age uh, and when you folks uh, gave us food here in the, in the villages. Mm -hmm. It was a very touching experience. It sounds like quite a moment for you. It was. Yeah. Well, now let's get into this Reva Ridge, which we've touched on a little bit. And uh, this is a very well-known, crucial point, a turning point, actually, um, towards the end of World War II. Well, um, can you describe the, the geography of the Apennines a little bit, about where the 10th Mountain Division um, has been placed by the military? We were facing a major uh, known mountain Mount Belvedere in the Apennines across the front lines. The Germans were well in place there and were peppering us every day with their artillery and small arms fire. And most of that was being directed from an observation post to the west on a high bluff called Riva Ridge. And Which is a series of mountains. No, Riva Ridge was an abrupt face of rocks, a sheer wall that I think the Germans felt that we never could assault their their position there. It was quite steep. And this is a sheer wall, it's about 2,000 uh, feet? Uh, 2,000 feet up, up mm -hmm. River Ridge. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were directed to climb River Ridge, but we climbed at night. So we had to set uh, pitons in the rocks, the hard rocks there, and set a fixed rope climb so, for, the, yeah, go ahead. for the troops to get to the top of Reva Ridge. So now you're in charge of this climb. The, the unit I had, I had the ammunition and pioneer platoon mm -hmm. primarily. There were men that were highly talented in, in uh, doing these engineering type jobs. Mm -hmm. And we were the ones that went out and set that, that climb that night. So the, tell, tell me about, how, how do you do that? How do you set a route in the dark? And, you know, people now... Uh, you feel your way. <laughs> decades you, later, they have headlamps, they have the sophisticated no, equipment. No, you, know. you, you didn't dare have any lights. There was uh, absolutely no lights at all allowed on the climb or in the valley that night, uh, the, the two nights that we made the climbs. So, so you're, that, strictly feeling the, feeling the slope, feeling your way up the mountain. Did you do any training in the dark, setting routes in the dark? We did training in Colorado. In those conditions? Before, uh, in dark conditions before we went over there. So what did you learn from your training about setting routes in, in the dark? Well, we, in Colorado, we, we trained in, in bare rock that was dry. But over <laughs> there, we had muddy, muddy chutes and whatnot. It was a mess trying to climb in that, in that rocks there. So, uh, you must have had to know your knots pretty well and feel pretty confident in your abilities when you're on a sheer rock face setting a route for hundreds of troops. Well, now the rest of the troops were on up the canyon and I can't account okay. for how, how the various companies organized their climbs there. I know that they, they had some experienced rock climbers in the groups that set their routes up, up the ridge for them to get up on the plateau above uh, on the top of Reva Ridge mm -hmm. where they were assembled ready to make the assault on the uh, observation post of the Germans and uh, this after making the climb and, and and getting the people up there for the previous two nights it was uh, quite a relief so this and so this is uh, as far as I understand the nights of 
February 18th, 19th, 1945, and you surprised the Germans. They definitely surprised the outpost up there, and there was quite a, quite a little skirmish there for a while, and then they, they retreated. And uh, the, I forgot which company it was that took over the observation post, but it wasn't long thereafter, and the Germans made a counterattack and were driven off the second time. So tell, tell me a little bit about, about the, the battle here. I mean, what, what was your role? I was not an infant, I was not a, 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 a infantryman holding a gun at that time or fighting the battle. The, the battalion companies had taken over the, the actual assault of the, of the uh, facility up there after we had gotten everyone up on, on the ridge. So once everyone's up on the ridge, then what did you do at that point? Well, we got orders to get our people down and get reorganized because they were getting ready for the full assault on Mount Belvedere as soon as that outpost was taken. And so the whole 10th Mountain Division made an assault straight to the north up every, every canyon and every creek that you could get to. And uh, got on Mount Belvedere, took Mount Belvedere and kept on rolling progressively to the north and northeast. So now, let's just step back a bit. At this point, this assault on Mount Belvedere. Um, that was a major battle. That was the major battle. Now, you were involved in battle there? Yes. And, and tell me about that. I mean, there were, what, 923 casualties um, and, and several deaths, uh, mis you know, uh, wounded in action, killed in action, a few prisoners of war. I mean, it must have been absolute chaos. Uh, the major, major uh, casualties and the real problem with the assault occurred on the right flank because there were small villages up the up the canyon areas to the, uh, that would be east of Mount Belvedere. And uh, the group that I was with went up the uh, west slopes of Mount Belvedere. And uh, we were in forested areas that, well, at that time you couldn't call them forests because the trees had had every, every living branch blown off of them by the time we went up through there. But, uh, we tried to clear all the trenches or any evidence of, of troops out there on that on that flank of Mount Belvedere. But the the best, worst battles were fought to the east, going up through the through these little villages, and there were heavy casualties in in that area. But you saw comrades killed or, or wounded. I did not. Not not the only people that I saw that were killed were in the mine minefields. Uh, all the other contacts that we had with, with uh, Germans, uh, they were surrendering to us, and we, we captured. Uh, what what did, do you remember? What they say a German would say when he would surrender to you? No, they just came out with their hands up. They didn't have much to say. <laughs> Sign language. <laughs> they 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 had dropped their arms and and didn't have much to say. The only only place that we had any any case where the the soldiers talked to us or talked back was when we were going across the Po Valley and there were long strings of of captured Germans that were being uh, sent to the rear, and as they came by us in long strings, we were asking them if they had any any uh, pistols or ammunition on them and trying to search them as these strings of people went by. If they had anything on them, we took it away from them. Uh, and that, that whole encounter, I took one, one pistol away from, a, from an officer that we encountered in the march. Do you still have it? I do. I don't have it. Alan has it now. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a Belgian um, brownie. A Belgian brownie, okay. Now, in that campaign, uh, uh, the assault on Mount Belvedere, there was a legendary ski jumper who was killed. Uh, Torger Tol Torger Tolson, yes, he was he was killed uh, by grenades, and he was well respected. He was quite a adventurous adventure soul. He he had come from 
from uh, war in, let's see, with, I can't think of the darn village that he was in. Uh, oh, I, I have it here. Yeah. He, he, was, yeah. he was a Finn, mm -hmm. and uh, he had volunteered for the American Army. And I don't know how in the world he got over here by, from Finland, but anyway, he was finally put in the 86th, and he was a highly respected individual. He was dead set on killing Germans, and, and that was his whole motive in life. And I'm sure that... Did you have much interaction with him at all, or oh, I, conversation? I, I've had conversations with Ogre several times, and uh, we were... We weren't really amazed that he was killed by grenades in, in, a, in a battle over there on the right, right flank because uh, we can just visualize him charging right on in with his hands flailing with grenades and everything else to, to kill Germans. And, he uh, had that ski jumper spirit. And he had wonderful ski jumping, skiing experience, but uh, he was a, a real hardened war hero long before he got with the 10th Mountain Division. Was, um, was it much of a blow to morale since, since he was this figure uh, who was well respected? There, there's too much going on. I, I wasn't right with Torga at the time. I heard the stories from friends, you know, that was with his unit. But uh, uh, there's so doggone much when the bullets are flying and the gr grenades are being tossed. Uh, you don't don't your main concern is to get the wounded and get them out, and get them back into some place where they can be taken care of. But uh, so it sounds like things are just moving so fast. It's just really um, you're you're just just trying to get the job done. Now there's total confusion, um, organized confusion, I should say when you're on on an attack mode and uh, it's just like later on before we got into the Po Valley uh, our battalion commander w was hit with uh, artillery shrapnel uh, in a jeep he was in a jeep we were trying to go down the pl into the plains of the Po Valley and uh, it's so so fast and so sudden I mean when you're on a on a real march like we were on and trying to get out of the Apennines and into the Po Valley. And that was that was the next step for you. Yes, we crossed crossed the Po River. The main thing was trying to get amphibious crossing set up and get across the Po Valley, the Po River, mm -hmm. and then on up to Lake Garda and get back into the mountains again. At, uh, lake Garda. You say that's an odd lake. It's a it was a beautiful lake. It was a glacial lake. The mountain slopes on either side of Mount Garden were, were sheer and came right down to the waterfront. And in years, the Italians had carved roads on both sides of Lake Garda. The Germans occupied the, the uh, west side of the lake, and we went up the east side of the lake. And in going, trying to go up the east side of the lake, we found that the Germans had blown all of the revetments, that is, the fill-in areas between tunnels. Uh, the slope comes down so, so sharp that they fill in between tunnels with these revetments and uh, make the road just hang on the side of the mountain. That sounds like some pretty dicey terrain for So you. we had to make amphibious attempts to get around each one of the tunnels and until we got up to the little town of Riva, which was at the head of Lake Garda. So you're on bo in boats? We were in rubber rubber rafts making cross getting around the around these uh, tunnel areas and uh, there was an artillery area uh, behind us someplace back there. Right? I don't know just exactly where they were but they were shooting across, almost three miles across the Lake Garda to hit the ends of the tunnels on the far side that the Germans were occupying. And they would come out of the tunnel and shoot at us, duck back in the tunnels. And so you were 
constantly trying to time it so you could make your assault from, from tunnel to tunnel. When we got to, got to Re uh, town of Riva, or little village of Riva, on the north end of Lake Garda, uh, then the troops took off up the, mount, up the steep mountains again, getting headed for Brenner Pass. And it was a fight then. Up, we, I was not involved in the, the battle from Riva Ridge on up to Brenner Pass, but uh, par practically all of the tenth, uh, the eighty-sixth was involved in that part. And what were what were you doing at that point? Well, I got sick. Mm -hmm. I had passed out. I, evidently, we'd gotten bad water someplace, and uh, so I was evacuated back into the Poe Valley down there for a hospital down there. Where I f they finally worked out what was bothering me because I just passed out with high so, fever. So you were down for a while? I was down for a little while after the, the war was kind of over at that point. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but it sounds like you had, had good field medical facilities. We did have excellent field medical facilities, but they were all behind us in Poe Valley. Nothing now, was up in the, in the canyon area on, on Lake Garda. Now speaking of, of the Poe Valley, and to get to Lake Garda you had to cross a river, is that the right? The Poe, Poe River. Poe River. And it's a major river right through right. the center. And what we understood from Judge Stewart was that usually um, you received mimeographed orders from your superiors? Yes, we did. And but in, orders. But it, when at the beginning of this operation, General Hayes made this decision, but there was no, nothing in writing. Did you did you hear anything about that or? I didn't. No, all all we got orders for was certain sections of the river that we were to occupy and and uh, take the rubber rafts that were provided for us and get across that river. So the army yeah. army engineers by that time were also trying to set up pontoon bridges in the Po Valley to bring the heavier equipment across, but uh, the first assaults were made in small rafts. So your uh, the the final uh, push or uh, over to Brenner Pass, you're sick, right? You're back right. in the Po Valley. Right. The Po Valley yeah. was a long walk. I might say, <laughs> we were we were not in constant combat in Po Valley. It was the Germans were on the run retreating, and we were on the run trying to catch them before they got across the Po Valley and on up. Right in. now, you had a leapfrog um, situation going on here with with the, the American troops we and, did. The, and the Germans ahead. Right. Tell us a little bit about that. How that worked. Well. I can't tell you too much about it outside of it. We just were on constant move uh, trying to catch up with the Germans. And uh, once in a while uh, a company would make contact with them, but we didn't make any real contact with the Germans. I don't know where they went to when we hit Lake Garda, unless they went off to the uh, west west side and went up where they knew that they they had artillery protection up there on those tunnels. So did you did you catch up with them before the end of the war? Yes, they fought their way. We had some pretty good skirmishes. The troops, uh, friends of mine that were in some of the companies, uh, had pretty good skirmishes north of Riva Ridge before they got to Brenner Pass. Each one of those small villages up there was a battleground. There were a lot of snipers, in, I understand, in, in some of those villages. I had a chance to go back after the hostilities and uh, went up into some of that area to see where the war kind of ended for our troops before they got to Brenner Pass. This, this was just after the war was over? Yes. So we're still in 1945. Right. You went back. Okay. Uh, the motor pool officer and myself <laughs> had the freedom of a jeep, and so we got around to see some of this country after, after the war was over. And, uh, and what, what were your impressions? Well, I was very much impressed by the Italian Alps. 
it was like being home again. I mean, it was beautiful mountains. Uh, the villages were nicely organized, a typical idea of Swiss villages. That's what your idea that you got out of it. The people, the village people were very, very cordial, even, at, you know, so soon after the war. And matter of fact, uh, I was fortunate in getting one real nice Italian carving piece that I brought home of a fisherman that was uh, quite a treasure. We had to mail it home because we were so involved in tr coming home that uh, we were not permitted to bring anything at all as a, when we moved as a troop. Was, the, was this a gift from somebody? Was this a gift? It was a gift for myself. I was so impressed by this. By this car I'm, I'm an ardent lover of wood carving, and I found this, this very detailed. I'll have to show it to you. And it's a very detailed little wood carving that was carved up there in the Italian Alps. So that's a real treasure for you to this and day. It's a real treasure. It's one of the few things that I was able to bring back from Italy. So at, at Brenner Pass, the Americans cut off the German supply line. Well, yes. everything just, just died there when World War II was declared over. It, uh, it, it, just like a curtain on a, on a stage coming <laughs> down. It, it happened very fast when it, when it happened. So what was that like for you? Tell me about well, where I, you Well, I, I was in, down in the valley in the hospital at that time, so I didn't get a chance to really see the effects of the closing of the war up there. So you were in pretty bad shape. I was in bad shape with some kind of, of uh, high temperature caused by, they claimed it was from using bi drinking bad water someplace. So I, I was taken right out of Reaver, uh, the t a little community of Reaver, right down the valley then to, to the evacuation hospital. And then I was rejoined with the with our battalions again, after I got out of the hospital. So you were in the hospital for three weeks? It, I was there two weeks almost, two weeks. I okay. think. And uh, I got out of the hospital and rejoined with the division, with the battalion, and we were moved west in, uh, in Italy, uh, east in Italy, uh, over toward the Adriatic Sea and up into a territory called Trieste territory. It's, it's the corner of Yugoslavia, Austria, uh, joining up their tight corner in Italy. And uh, in World War II, the British, the Fifth, uh, Fifth Army that came up our right flank during the Italian campaign, had gone into the Trieste territory and there was, even after the war was over, there was real hostilities up there among the tri people of Trieste and the uh, British First, Fifth Army. So. D due to their experiences in World War One, uh, due to their their whatever they did there in World War One, so they moved moved our whole battalion over there and to occupy that territory and kind of quiet things down. So we I can't remember exactly what the length of time was. It it's it's a blur right now. But <laughs> it was not too long after that they told us to get them uh, to get trucks up there and get us into Milan and uh, surrender all of our equipment that we had and get ready for a very fast return to the States. And that was the first knowledge that, that we were being taken out of Italy. We were bivouacked in a, in a park in a hot summer day when you couldn't get enough liquid in you to hardly stay alive. It was real hot. And uh, we boarded ships or planes and... But they had you surrender all of your equipment. All the equipment. We, we, we so came, you're, you're we came home your pitons, really... your your hammers. <laughs> we, we had long lost that. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we came home what you call stripped. So what and was that like you're in standing in the sun in a hot day in, in Italy just saying, and, the, and the, your the higher ups are saying, surrender all your gear. It must have been... Uh, quite a load off your shoulders and I'm sure that's an understatement. It was a it was a very <laughs> joyous time among the group. There were a lot of a lot of a lot of joy in the whole affair. 
to get relieved of all of it. We kind of had a load lifted off our back. We, we knew we were coming home, but we didn't realize that we were coming home to go on to San Francisco in the South Pacific until we were on the trains headed for our two weeks home leave before assembling in San Francisco, and then we knew that we were headed for the South Pacific. But fortunately, the train I was on pulled into Denver nine o'clock on VJ day. So that must have been a pleasant surprise for you. It was a big surprise because I was literally home, and the war was over. And your your wife had set up a house there, home uh, there. Jean Jean already had a home established in Denver, and I was really home by that time. So we were given leave to do whatever we wanted to between then and early December. And it was uh, early December that year we got orders to go to Camp Carson, Colorado and discharge all the enlisted men. And soon as the enlisted men were discharged, they sent our contingent of officers to Fort Riley, Kansas, of all places where we get our di got our discharge. So and then, this, yeah. this was just before Christmas. And it was snow and the roads were icy, but we were all determined to get, those of us that were going to Denver were all determined to drive back from uh, mm -hmm. Kansas there to Colorado and get back home. So it was really over it at was that point. It was over at that time. Of but, course. But getting back to, to your wife, Jean, she worked for a company that was developing a tram to go up Reaver Ridge. That is correct, and that was how I found out that long before anyone else in our outfit knew that we were going to Italy, uh, Gene told me that, that uh, Stearns Rogers engineering firm in Denver, Colorado, were building some aerial funiculars to be sent to Italy for the troops to use over there in the mountains. And uh, she was in, working in the office of Strategic Materials, uh, which was a, an office connected with the Army and, and the Stearns Rogers. And so she was privileged to that information, handling all the paperwork that was going on. But you know, not one of those aerial funiculars arrived in time for the crime, climb on Reaver Ridge. Were you, were you counting on it? We didn't. I didn't really know what to, to expect when we got to Reaver Ridge. I didn't know that they had, Gene said they were being built. I didn't know that they'd been shipped. But, uh, we were hopeful that something like that might show up that we could use, but it never did. So you had, you had to do your, your uh, set your route. Um, we in, set in our routes, routes in the anyway. rocks and climbed. Tell me about the morale of troops who have trained together in this intense mountaineering skills. Was there a special bond that, that you had? Oh, with very these guys? definitely. Uh, there was very little, there was no rank shown. You ask people to help you do this or help you do that, and that was it. Uh, I don't know what it would have been like in some of the company lines, but in headquarters company and with the motor pool and with the ammunition pioneer platoon and, and those units that I worked with a lot, uh, there was, uh, rank didn't make a darn bit of difference. You're all in it together. You're all in it together. And do you think your, your training at Camp Hale together had something to do with that? Well, I think, I think mental attitude of, of, the, of the people, even before they got in the Army, and then when they got in, in for the training, uh, it, it uh, all kind of melded together. And, and how did that experience with these guys uh, during the war shape the way you subsequently lived your life, the rest of your life? Well, when I got out of the Army, I was, I was interested to get back into the, into the field of wildlife management. And I immediately found a job with the Fish and Wildlife Service in Denver. And uh, then in 1950, 
I got orders to leave the, sh the group that was in a research group in, it, in Denver that was working in the field. I was sent to Washington, D.C. to go into the Office of Information in Washington, D.C. And after eight years in Washington, D.C., locked in an office more or less, I had some field trips, but nothing like I wanted. A little office fever at that point? Yeah, <laughs> so I asked to be, find a place on the, on the West Coast, any place on the West Coast, I'd accept an assignment. And uh, some friends of mine in the Forest Service asked me one day if I'd, I'd, I'd take a job any place on the Forest Service that they could find for me. And so I told them, I'll, I'll go any place on the West Coast. Lord behold, they came up with an assignment for Juno for the third informational officer that had been assigned any place in the United States with the Forest Service, which was a new venture for them. And this is 1959? 1950, no, this was, it was 1950, yeah, 59. And uh, unbeknownst to me, they had contacted my wife and asked her if she would be willing to go to Juneau. Because at that time, <laughs> Juneau was considered a hardship assignment because of housing. Things she, haven't changed much. And she, so she said she would be willing to go any place that I wanted to go to work. And uh, so we left Silver Springs, Maryland in a little Chevrolet station wagon loaded to the, <laughs> till the tires were almost flat with uh, Alan in a black Labrador. Alan was four years old and the black Labrador crammed in the back seat of that station wagon and away we took off across the plains and up into Saskatchewan and finally on the Alaska Highway and up, up the highway with our, our terminal, our object was to get to Haines, Alaska to catch the last ferry for the season, which was sailing from Haines to Juneau on the Chil little Chilkat ferry that took us into Tea Harbor late, late at night on that, on that trip. And I, we woke the next day to find that we were in statehood and the Forest Service was vacating the territorial building to make room for the state capitol and that we were to occupy a, a temporary quarters in the Fifth Street schoolhouse up back of the capitol building until the federal building was built down in the flats. So you got so, here as everything was starting. So that was the, my introduction to, to Juno. For Jean, it was a little different. As she found out, their housing in Juno was, was not to be found. We put up the first, first night in a, a little, I'll call it a minor, ex minor shack in downtown Juno on almost one of the alleys up there in order to get by for the, for the couple, first couple nights. And then Jean went house hunting in the, out in the valley, uh, which strictly was a valley at that time with very little residence. Uh, uh, Mendenhaven was just getting started. It was a dirt road to the Glacial Center area. And uh, I'll never forget it. My first time of seeing that road to the Glacier Center, here are two uh, borrow pits on either side of that road with water running through them and fish migrating up the, up the edge of the road. She found a, a builder building a house down on Riverside Drive which faced the pastures of the Alaska dairy. And uh, they had kept those fields well fertilized all winter. It must and make they, quite a pastoral environment. And they, the other side of that pasture was the Mendenhall River. So from our front door, we looked out across a field of green and into the, into the Mendenhall. A little, a little prettier than your office in Washington, D.C.? <laughs> oh, definitely so. And the big surprise came in the spring. With the spring migration, that field was literally covered so you could walk on the backs of ducks, geese, swan, and every other kind of migrating bird that you could think of across those fields. 
It also included the ravens and the eagles and the others that participated, but it was a sight to behold. And, and I know our family enjoyed that very much. Sounds incredible. The house was built by a well-known Junoite, uh, Troy Andrews, who has Fisherman's Bend today. He and his father had started the house. And we asked him if he would build a house and leave the interior for us to finish. And Gene and I did the finishing then on long summer nights, evenings, I should say, when the light was... A, that light, that so, light came in handy. So that you could build clear up to midnight. And but that was our introduction. And then you ended up as uh, the information officer for the Forest Service. Well, and that's you, what and you I was, pioneered some, some yeah, new programs. That's what I was hired for in Washington, D.C. But the Forest Service wasn't quite attuned to this new shift in, in public service. They had been more concerned of dealing with pulp mills and loggers and, and forests. So we had kind of a lone man's occupation for a while until we got the Mendenhall Visitor Center established. And at that time I recruited people from Maynard Miller's uh, summer camp up on the Taku Glacier as uh, visitor information people who could talk about the glacial environment that we were viewing from that center. And, so you uh, hired the first interpreters at the Glacier Visitor Center? That they were the first interpreters that we had at the Visitor Center. Later on, I hired an interpreter from the National Park Service in San Francisco, and uh, he came up and he t hired other people for interpreters there at the Menden Hall, and shortly thereafter we had the opportunity to open a visitor center on the uh, Chugach National Forest at Portage Glacier. And that was followed by, by uh, a small facility down on the t uh, South Tongas in Ketchikan. But long before this got started, I think the most exciting experience that I had was traveling on the inaugural cruise of the uh, ferry system in southeast Alaska. That was and, the Malice Bean. And having a chance to meet and talk with Governor Egan at the time. And I proposed an idea from him to consider of having Forest Service personnel board the ferry system to act as interpreter for the visiting public. And uh, he bought the idea, and we slowly, over the years, began to develop that. And I can't imagine how it's developed. It, today, it just blows my mind. It's the what is going on on the ferry system today. And it must be gratifying for you to think of uh, how you were there from the, the ground up, if you will, for right. these different programs that are still going very strong today. But Bob, Bob Hackala did a real good job of picking people out, developing a program of interpreters. And, and we, uh, we had some other experiences with the school systems. And they, they were getting interested in outdoor education, and they were wondering if we couldn't lend something to their program and training young people in forest environments. So we hired people for that and got that, that one started. But unfortunately, my wife's health failed, and I was forced to leave the Forest Service on, at retirement time in 1977, and we moved south to Washougal, Washington, until I returned here in, in October of uh, 1905. 2005, just, just in time for your, would have been your 88th birthday. Right. And you'll be turning 90 this I'll year. I'll be turning 90 this year in October. Bef I want to backtrack just a little bit about skiing. Now, with the 10th Mountain Division, you were trained, you, you, you were recruited as a skier and a, and a mountaineer and a, mount, and a mountain climber. Right. You use your climbing skills. Did you use your, your, 
did you ski at all in, in the Apennines or during this campaign in Italy? Was no, we did not. No skis? Uh, there were, the, the uh, 10th Mountain Division had some reconnaissance people that went out a little bit higher up in the mountains to the west of Mount Belvedere and got into some snow areas up there and there's some records of, of uh, some of the surveys that they made up through there where the mountain troops were and whatnot that were part of the intelligence program for the 10th Mountain Division, but I'd, I was not aware of all of that until after the war was over and I'd heard about it. Now here in Juneau, were you able to ski at all? This was be before Eagle Crest, our Long area. before Eagle Crest, uh, we skied here in Juneau. Uh, we skied on Mount Douglas over there. Trying to, what the heck was that camp called? Uh, the, um, the third cabin. Third cabin area. Yeah, Dan we, Moeller Trail. We, we, Don Moeller Trail and mm -hmm. ski up there. I, uh, I never will forget the day that we came down from skiing up there and Alan was quite young and you remember when you left the canyon up there, that housing development was just getting started on the west side of, of Juneau. And the, the trail came down and ended right on the end of one of those roads. And Alan, being a young young kid, skier, no, no fear, came down there and <laughs> turned the corner and here sat a car right in his road and he went right up on the hood. That sounds like kind of a hard landing. It's a hard landing. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you have much interaction with Sig Olson or, or, or uh, Tom Stewart during those, those I days? I had no at Third Cabin? interaction at all with Tom Stewart. Uh -huh. He joined the unit uh, late after we were, I believe, when we were still in Italy. But did you hear in Juneau at all? Did you ever get no. to trade uh, 10th Mountain Division experiences? I haven't yet uh, had okay. the experience to go down and sit down with him and talk. I've. Mm -hmm. With Sig, uh, his family and mine uh, did a lot together uh, all the, during the time that we were uh, first located here in, in uh, Alaska. So you're, you're both d veterans of the 10th Mountain Division. Right. We, we spent many vacations together over in the islands and, and uh, a lot of a lot of social work together. So you had not only your war experience in common, but your love of the outdoors in common. Right, right. So we, we skied up, I think some of the first skiing that I think I did with him was, with Sig, was up on, uh, shoot. Probably a, a third cabin? No, no, no. Mount uh, Troy? Up on this side. Oh, Heitzelman Ridge. Uh, Heitzelman Ridge. Right. And, uh, you took a helicopter up there. I can't find the pictures. I wished I could because I have pictures that we took uh, the ski slopes uh, down Heinzelman Ridge. Nancy Loving Lovingston uh, helicoptered us up there for those d experiences at that time since ski, ski lifts were not, not started yet in Juneau. Well, you will be celebrating your 90th birthday very soon. Um, if someone asked you, in, 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 in a, a nutshell, um, what was the most important lesson or, uh, that you took away from your, from your wartime experience that you've um, used in, in, your, in your life, what would, would that be? Well, how to work with, with people and uh, always try to make a tight bond a comrade sit and uh, get on with the job. Uh, as I told you, and there, there was no rank in the army that we were in, that I was in. And uh, a lot of the other jobs that we had, uh, that's the way I would like to have always approached it. So you're all Let, in it together. Lay out the job and all work together on it. Jack Culberth, thank you. You're entirely your welcome. Time. It's been my pleasure, and I'm amazed at the efforts you folks go to. <laughs> uh, and I always ask, is there anything you want to add, something I, I didn't ask you about that you wanted to share with us? I can't think what, what it would be right offhand. Okay. 
I'd like, I'd like to show you that one Italian carving I have up there. That's one of the few things I know where it is. All my other stuff is still in boxes. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. I'll show you those medals. Yeah, we definitely want to see those. They're over there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's one other medal that I got when I was working here in Juneau. Uh huh. I was active with the Boy Scout troops mm -hmm. for a number of years, and uh, they awarded me the Silver Beaver Award for my work as a commissioner in uh -huh. the local Scout troops. Uh huh. And I, I have that award over there, which is, mm -hmm. is a nice silver beaver. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we were active. I were active at the chapel by the lake, mm -hmm. and had uh, mm -hmm. I had troops there, and and we were very active in other troops all over the Juneau area, and, mm -hmm. and out at the camp. And was now are Sig's uh, sons similar in age to Alan? I'm sorry? Are Sig's sons similar in age to your son, Alan? Uh, mm -hmm. Sig's boys were a little older, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. uh, we got along fine. Mm -hmm. They tolerated him a lot when we were, <laughs> particularly when we were on summer vacations over in the islands. <laughs> but, uh, and with the Boy Scouts, it sounds like, you know, um, that you wanted to, to pass on to your son that it was uh, the, the outdoor experiences and being prepared. Oh, we, we pushed the scouts to get all the Eagle Scouts we could out of the council because the national uh, organization was sending troops to Japan in 1970. And I was assigned the duty of taking the Alaska troops, and that involved Eagle Scouts from Ketchikan to Barrow and all in between. And fortunately, Allen was one of those that qualified uh, for his Eagle Scout uh, award, and he was one of the group. So all told, there was some 40, 40 boys that I took to, to Japan. We went into Kyoto, and we camped on Mount Fuji, and ended going as far north as Mount, uh, uh, see, we went up to... Uh, that must have been quite an experience. It was a, a wonderful experience of almost three weeks. So uh, the boys saw a lot of a lot of Japan, and uh, I one experience that I had, uh, I'll never forget. I had a boy that lost his passport the first day in Kyoto <laughs> when we arrived. So I phoned the the um, uh, offices here in Tokyo and uh, tried to find out how I could. Get a, get a passport to get him out of the country, to get him home. And they said, well, don't worry about it. When you get in Tokyo, you'll be in such and such a camp. I can't remember the name of the camp they had set up for us. And one of those days, please come down to the, uh, to the uh, offices, and here we will have a passport made out for him, ready to go. So I walked into this office, and a lady come trotting over a little faster walk than normal to a man. Good guys here, it was one of my formal secretaries from Juneau with the Forest Service. <laughs> and she had joined, I, she was a secretary. Right place, for, right time. <laughs> I was a secretary for only a few years to, that I had experience with her here in Juneau. And then she joined the Foreign Services and went into the embassy and ended up at the embassy there in, Japan, in Tokyo. <laughs> it's a small world. <laughs> yeah, Do you know people usually all often show up at the right moment, no matter uh, where you are. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was a very delightful experience for me. Hmm. Oh, yeah, sure. I I can always tell Sigus tell Jack a story. You need him listening to you. Okay. Okay. I, yeah. So what we're they're getting is shots of you know us kind of nodding and listening to each other. So. Uh -huh. we, can, we can cut this together. Um, so, um, anyway, I, I found your your story is absolutely uh, fascinating, and uh, what a, what a time you had. Oh. Um, and of course, I'm I'm trying to keep talking so that, that I don't ask you a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so you um, you must be in, enjoying being back in Juneau and. Uh, 
being surrounded by the green. And, yeah, you got it? Okay. All right. All righty. Yeah, I'm glad to be back here with my eyes, <laughs> eyes and my hearing yeah. failing me. Can you guys stay set for just a second? Sure. I just want to... Got you all hooked up here? Yeah. I okay. think he just wants us to sit down for a second longer. Okay. Uh, oh, but no, he wants to show us the um, the carving, too. Okay. Let me see about and that. And the metals are over there. Right. Um, guys, 